everybody uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, thank you for joining us another edition of Public Leadership Institute's uh, online uh, conversations. Uh, this particular uh, session uh, we're going to be uh, entitled uh, Resisting with a Vision Working to Restore Abortion Coverage. Uh, perfectly timed given um, the attack on abortion rights and reproductive justice around this country. Uh, and um, I hope everyone's excited for uh, some experts around the country uh, to bring a, a set of tools, resources, and communication strategies and how to move this conversation forward and broadly support uh, proactive policy to, uh, again, as the title suggests, um, restore abortion coverage uh, across America. My name is Dave Woodward. I am the National Network Director with Public Leadership Institute and will be your host and facilitator, tech, I mean technology facilitator for today's session. I'm also a county official and a former state legislator and I'm, um, this is a topic that's uh, very important to me and um, like all of you, uh, looking forward to the in-depth conversation we're about to have. Uh, before we get to that, we had a couple housekeeping items that I want to get to and so we'll go through that and then I'll introduce our uh, presenters uh, and then we'll get the presentation underway. Uh, for those who are uh, have never joined one of our sessions before, I'm, just, I'm happy to welcome you to one of Public Leadership Institute's online webinar uh, training sessions, message sessions, communication uh, uh, sessions that we hold uh, usually every couple weeks. Uh, the Public Leadership Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan policy leadership uh, center, uh, really focused on bringing public attention to a host of issues around the areas of equity and justice. And we work with public leaders uh, across the country to improve, uh, who will work to improve economic and social conditions for all Americans. You can get a lot of information about a number of publications uh, that we have, as well as a host of other resources to connect you uh, to others to help uh, support your work um, at, at our website www.publicleadershipinstitute.org. Uh, on the screen now um, there are a number of publications, uh, the progressive agenda for state and lo uh, local communities, uh, Voice on Values which is a communication manual, um, and uh, one of our more recent publications, the playbook for abortion rights which is a uh, a book of model policy of advancing proactive, uh, proactive abortion rights policies at the local and state level. Um, all of these uh, publications are available for download uh, free of charge at publicleadershipinstitute.org um, and we can also arrange for hard copies uh, by contacting us which you can contact us through the website. So please do so. Uh, these type of sessions are, we believe, is most valuable when uh, your, uh, your, your questions, thoughts, concerns, um, and voices are brought into the conversation. We have a number of ways for you to participate, and the more participation, the better, and we will make time for all those appropriate questions um, and, and thoughts as they come. There's a uh, the way you can do that um, by raising your hand, by clicking on the hand icon on your control panel um, at any time during the course of the presentation when we pause for questions, um, I can unmute you and you can uh, join the conversation directly. We also realize that sometimes people join us and that's not the most, uh, uh, it, it's not so easy to uh, uh, join uh, uh, through audio. Uh, we have the ability to type questions in the question box, so do feel free to do those and we will uh, move through those as, um, uh, and again, the we can get through as many of those as possible at our question and answer spot. You can email me at dwoodward at publicleadershipinstitute.org as the presentation is underway. If you have any other technical issues or need additional information, um, if you have any questions after uh, today's session, feel free to reach out. We'll make sure that we'll get you either to our presenters or to the best person to answer your question um, after today's sessions. Um, one last thing uh, that we do uh, provide and record these sessions so that you can come back and visit them. Um, and you can do that by accessing through our website again at www.publicleadershipinstitute.org. So today's topic, like uh, we mentioned, is uh, resisting with a vision, working to restore abortion coverage. We have got uh, three um, incredible presenters that are with us today. And so first let me uh, 
start with um, Kelly Baden, the Director of State Advocacy with the Center for Reproductive Rights. Um, Kelly joined the center in 2013 and oversees the center's state and local advocacy within the United States, which includes developing, implementing, and managing the center's multifaceted uh, reproductive rights policy initiatives and strategies aimed at moving proactive policy strategies forward in fighting against abortion restrictions in the states. This includes leading convenings for state advocates and legislators, building the capacity of local partners through the development of policy resources and trainings, and overseeing technical assistance support to those in the field. Kelly joined the center as the policy and advocacy advisor in 13 and then um, became the director of state policy in 2015. Kelly, thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure. Also, uh, we have uh, Rena, uh, Ravina Deptory. Did I say that all right, Ravina? Ah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, is the is the director of uh, state strategies uh, for um, at all above all? She oversees the campaign state and local lab sites and um, that develop and launch innovative strategies for abortion coverage advocacy that uh, that include organizing communications and proactive policy advocacy. Prior to her time uh, with all above all campaign, Ravina helped advance reproductive rights, health and justice in Arkansas and Mississippi. Uh, where she advocated against a number of threats to reproductive economy and organized youth in both states. She holds a bachelor's degree in economics from New York University and a master's in communication from the University of Illinois, uh, uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So, Ravina, thank you for being with us. Sure. And lastly, uh, we have joining us is uh, Lydia Stuckey. Um, who is a senior program director um, in Conway Strategic um, for more than a decade of experience in issue advocacy, message development, and public uh, relations focused predominantly on women's reproductive health and rights at Conway Strategic. Lydia works with the All Above All campaign to execute communication strategies towards lifting bans on health insurance coverage for abortion. She also works on the comms project team and opinion research and messaging collaborative uh, to expand the use of evidence-based messaging to advance coordinated and proactive message strategies for health, uh, reproductive health, rights, and justice. Prior to working at Conway Strategic, Lydia worked as a senior associate for program and policy at the Reproductive Health Technologies Project, coordinating projects around abortion messaging and expanding access to emergency contraception in the United States. Lydia is a native Hoosier and received a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Butler University. Lydia, thank you for being with us. And Kelly, I'm going to hand uh, controls over to you. Great. Should have it now. Okay. All right, great. Hi, everybody. Dave. Um, I'm going to dive right in, and I'm going to trust that if you can't hear or see my slides, that um, somehow Dave will, will let me know. Um, and I'm going to be pretty top line as I go through these slides. Um, and uh, I'm open, of course, to clarifying questions or further questions later, um, later on in the hour. But I want to be able to just kind of get through them and, um, and leave Ravina and Lydia with enough time. So I'm going to just ground us for a second. I'm going to talk about the 2017 landscape, um, where we are so far in this year around state abortion restrictions and state proactive policies. Um, talk a little bit about what's happening in Congress and how that relates. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Ravina um, for more um, kind of case studies and then Lydia for some discussions around public support and messaging. And then, as I said, we'll have hopefully plenty of time for questions. So. Um, Again, just to get us on the same page, I always like to start with this. Uh, abortion is incredibly common. It's incredibly safe. We used to say one, about one in three uh, women would have an abortion in the U.S. in their uh, reproductive lives. Newer data that's just coming out shows that it's probably now a little bit closer to one in four. Um, but again, incredibly common and safe. And uh, Americans overall really support abortion rights. Um, you know, depending on how you ask the question, of course, you can get numbers like seven in ten who support the Roe v. Wade decision. 
um, you know, 58% who say abortion should be legal in all or most cases, um, et cetera, and so on. But, it, but broad public support overall for the um, continued legality and, and acceptability of abortion. Um, when you dive deeper, you see that people, you know, really think that once a woman has made that decision, she deserves to be able to have good quality health care with dignity and respect and in her community and free from coercion. Um, and it should be accessible um, and, and comfortable and all of those good things. Um, yet somehow, d despite that, we have had more than, uh, you know, 334 um, plus abortion restrictions passed, um, in some cases quietly, in some cases more loudly, um, in the state since 2011. And of course, um, I imagine that most of you on the call um, know that intimately. Um, one of the, the particular issues that we're focusing on today and that all of Evolve, of course, focuses on is around abortion coverage um, or insurance coverage for abortion in particular. Um, and I highlight this in part because I think it plays well to the kind of federal state um, conversation that, that anytime you're talking about you know, abortion rights and abortion access has to, of course, come into play because there's so many levels of, of policies guiding um, what abortion acceptability looks like in the U.S. So um, again, just to ground this, the Hyde Amendment is a, um, a federal um, annual appropriations um, language that essentially uh, says that any woman who qualifies for um, Medicaid or, or other similar forms of public health insurance um, cannot get uh, cannot use that insurance coverage for abortion with very limited circumstances. Um, the rape, pregnancies resulting from rape, incest, or um, pregnancies that threaten her life, um, not not even her health. So, um, you know, that is already kind of uh, a huge um, barrier to many people to be able to get the abortion care that they um, might need. Um, and because Medicaid is a joint federal state program, um, some states have taken it upon themselves to step up and provide um, that coverage for abortion care with their state Medicaid funds. Um, some have done that uh, proactively, some have done that as a result of a court order. Um, but as you can see, the green states, um, sadly far and away, the, the majority of them, about 35, um, do not do that. Um, and so, you know, again, we're sort of left with this, this uh, patchwork, but mostly really paltry system of um, people who um, get their insurance from particular government programs who don't have the same ability to access affordable abortion care um, that they uh, deserve. Um, so where are we right now in 2017? Uh, you know, again, as, as I said, as you know, um, we've been in the, the midst of this years long avalanche of abortion restrictions in the States. Um, just like many things, abortion restrictions um, have trends. Um, and the, where we are right now so far in this year, um, especially coming up post the, the big Supreme Court decision last year, the whole one's healthy heller set win, um, and even you know, post-election, um, we're seeing a lot of abortion bans, um, especially bans later in pregnancy and bans on specific um, second trimester abortion procedures. Uh, and of course, because the, the national conversation around insurance coverage and healthcare costs um, continues with, with you know, the ACA um, fights and, and others, um, conversations in the states about coverage and funding of reproductive healthcare services in particular um, continue to be a huge trend. Um, and that's both, you know, Planned Parenthood defunding fights and um, coverage bills. Um, we're at, this is, I think I pulled these numbers uh, last week, so it's a little bit higher now, but almost 400 restrictive bills introduced, um, almost 20 enacted, um, and, you know, as many of you know, a lot of state sessions are done, but um, some of them, like Louisiana, are, are just getting started, so those numbers will continue to grow. Um, but there's also been this upswing in um, proactive reproductive rights, health, and justice bills. Um, and we're at about 56 so far um, to advance abortion access and coverage specifically in 22 states. So that's really exciting news. And, and these can be anything from um, uh, the home health acts that are percolating in about five states right now, which, um, as you can imagine, kind of stems from the Supreme Court decision that came down last June to um, you know, a bill in California, for example, that is uh, seeking to make medication abortion coverage available on um, public university campuses. 
Um, I wanted to flag also just the contraception bills in particular, um, and I blatantly stole this wonderful chart from the Guttmacher Institute, as you can see, and it's on guttmacher.org, which if you don't know is an incredible resource for data on these issues. Um, and I, you know, I just wanted to pull this up because, of course, we're kind of back to um, having these intensive conversations about insurance coverage for contraception. Um, which is, I think, something we thought, you know, we had sort of solved already with the, the no copay um, contraceptive coverage benefit under the ACA. But I wanted to flag this because, you know, states are, are recognizing um, that you will be the ones who have to step up and fill the gap that um, we fear that, you know, the federal government is going to create um, if and when they remove the contraceptive coverage benefit and or, um, you know, do other terrible things to our health insurance system. Um, so, so many states have, have taken that on and are um, creating their own contraceptive coverage and guarantees with no copay. Others are doing um, other forms of, of policies that help make it easier to access contraception, including, for example, um, allowing someone to pick up, you know, six or 12 months of their birth control prescription at the pharmacy at once rather than having to go back every month. So that's just a great handy chart. Um, and so the proactive, you know, vibe in the states that is, is continuing to pick up has, uh, you know, friends in Congress as well. Um, and, you know, folks in the House, of course, are, are probably similar to many of you and have been operating in a pretty hostile environment for a few years. Um, but we wanted to, I wanted to just lift up that, you know, even kind of post-election, um, there is still this recognition and desire to tap into the you know, the broader resistance energy that's happening, um, you know, the clear uh, kind of upswing in um, uh, women's activism with the Women's March and with, you know, some recent data that sh I think showed that women are really leading the kind of, you know, resistance and, and increase in civic engagement on the ground. Um, and just shout out that, you know, there, there are these great proactive pro-choice bills in Congress too, and, and we know they're not getting signed into law um, anytime soon, but, but that's not their only purpose. And so, the Each Woman Act, which uh, is around the issue we're talking about today specifically, which would repeal the Hyde Amendment, reinstate abortion coverage, um, the Women's Health Protection Act, which is around um, kind of uh, making sure that states cannot uh, do what they've done for the past few years, which is, you know, single out abortion as needing um, different uh, sets of laws and other health care procedures that, that don't advance women's health. Um, and then the Global Her Act, which is the a new one that unfortunately is needed to um, to repeal the global gag rule, which um, of course President Trump unfortunately reinstated um, in his first days in office. Um, so again, this kind of I just want to highlight that you know this um, need to be proactive despite uh, not having the numbers is um, you know unfortunately where we are in many places right now. Um, but there's still a lot of energy for for us to all be doing that. Um, one of the other campaigns that All Above All launched kind of right after the election is this Won't Be Punished campaign. Um, and, you know, this was to really, again, kind of say, we're not backing down. Um, we are going to continue to call out the Trump-Pence agenda for women, which is not a good one, um, and, you know, stand up against the Hyde Amendment and, and just keep, um, keep plugging away and keep building the support that we know that we have. Um, uh, around the country. And so this was a hugely successful, um, hopefully you can see the photos, there's everything from, you know, Google ads to bus ads to, um, I think they wrapped the um, copies of the papers delivered on Capitol, to congressional offices on Capitol Hill with a, um, you know, with this kind of slogan around it um, and, and all kinds of online things to engage our supporters around this issue. So. I think the moral of my story is that, you know, there's still, of course, a lot going on in the states um, and a lot of threats nationally as well. Um, and this proactive energy and, um, uh, you know, desire to really kind of push back is, is continuing and we need to, we all need to kind of make sure that we are channeling that energy um, into, into good actions and also making sure that reproductive rights, health and justice are not kind of left out of the broader um, incredible progressive resistance that is happening. Oh, and I wanted to add, <laughs> and Dave, I'm totally going to talk to you about this later as a county commissioner, but I, there is a role for local elected officials in this as well. Um, we have been working for a couple of years um, 
both at the center with all above all, of course, and with the National Institute for Reproductive Health and lots of local partners to engage um, mayors and, and county commissioners and city council uh, members to speak out on um, these issues as well. So the some tax here represents um, localities that have taken public stands on um, federal abortion rights bills, in particular the Each Woman Act or abortion coverage issues and the Women's Health Protection Act. So um, you can get more information on what that looks like uh, at the websites listed there. You can also email my colleague Ashley, who's Email address is listed there for sample resolution language. Um, and we, if you are a local elected official, we'd love to work with um, you and with local advocates in your city to um, see what that could look like. Um, so I'm going to stop. And Dave, if you could, I think, grant Ravina access to the slides, that would be great. I will do that next. And Ravina, you should have uh, a prompt for control and just take control and we can. I think, uh, is it, can, can you see it? Yep. And just, you can okay, write and play with the chat. Great, great. And, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Kelly, and thanks, Dave. I'm really excited to talk to everyone today. Um, and. So I, I really just kind of want to pick up where Kelly left off, um, which is that, you know, we are, you know, while obviously the environment, um, certainly in, in D.C., um, has, you know, it is, um, you know, toxic in many ways when it comes to conversations about reproductive health care and abortion, um, you know, I think we're hearing from um, our partners and, and from our supporters that, you know, folks are really looking to, um, you know, the, the states and localities to really lead the way in terms of, um, uh, you know, this issue specifically, but also really in terms of, of um, you know, pushing a, a visionary progressive agenda um, where, where it's possible. Um, and so, you know, I have a slide here that I've titled Progressive States are Leading the Way on Abortion Coverage. Um, and what's important to know is that, um, you know, the, the states that I'm going to be talking about today um, are more progressive states, um, but, you know, Kelly just talked about some of the local work that we do, um, and there are also a handful of, of states that are not really that progressive that have um, introduced proactive legislation in the past um, around abortion coverage issues, including um, ones that, that specifically target um, abortion coverage with respect to Medicaid. Um, and so I wanted to kind of just go through, you know, why is it that states are, are taking this issue on? Because um, there are a handful of states that have been working on this, and it's, it's fairly new in the last, like, five years, I'd say. Um, with a few exceptions. So, you know, the first, you know, shouldn't be a mystery to anyone on this call, you know, why do we introduce any policy? It's really to be able to make real change um, in, in your community and in your state. Um, and so, you know, we know that um, ensuring abortion coverage is really at the core about affordability. And so bills like the ones I'm going to be talking about today, um, you know, really do change the way um, that people are able to access abortion in the state. Um, you know, in particular by making abortion a real option for communities where affordability does present a real barrier. You know, when we talk specifically about the Hyde Amendment and bans on Medicaid coverage of abortion, you know, we know that that targets young people, people of color, you know, communities that typically experience, already experience disparities to healthcare. Um, and so, you know, the bills that I'm going to be talking about today, um, you know, these three in particular are passable just given the political makeup of the state. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of, I think, excitement and enthusiasm about the ability to, to really, um, you know, make some good change and, and you know, create change within, within communities that um, really need it. Um, you know, second, I think even in states um, where there might not be the opportunity to sort of pass something right away, um, you know, there is always a reason to sort of um, advance an issue like abortion coverage. Um, you know, because it, it gives um, either a, a particular legislator or advocate or a state or a locality the ability to really add their voice to, um, you know, what's really becoming a chorus of voices at every level of government calling for the end of the Hyde Amendment. So, you know, Kelly talked a little bit about local, um, you know, local bodies like um, city councils and county commissions that have spoken out against the Hyde Amendment um, and um, called for the passage of the Each Woman Act. Um, but, you know, even in terms of state legislation um, in more red states, um, you know, I think there is, um, I, I'd say 
you know, the Hyde Amendment is arguably one of the most devastating, if not the most devastating restriction on abortion access that, you know, women are um, living under in your state right now. So even if you're one of those, you know, small number of 15 states that does actually um, have Medicaid coverage um, of abortion in your state, you know, there are still people who are living in federal detention, um, you know, federal employees, Peace Corps volunteers, you know, all types of people that are um, that get their insurance from the federal government that are subject to the Hyde Amendment living in your state right now. Um, and so, you know, even um, in a case where, um, you know, you might not be able to pass something, um, it's a way to start building momentum towards um, eventually ending this, you know, really heinous policy. And then the last, I think, um, which is, I think, compelling to a lot of people, um, a, a lot of advocates and a lot of legislators, and, and certainly to um, any of us who do any work in red states, is to really be able to proactively shape a dialogue around abortion and abortion coverage um, that isn't just a reaction to restrictions. So it's what you really want to do is have a conversation about the important role that abortion plays, like let's say, for example, um, in a, a woman's economic security or in you know, um, poverty, for example. Um, you know, you don't want to be trapped into a conversation talking about a 24-hour waiting period or a 72-hour waiting period. Um, you know, what you really want to do is be able to, to speak your values first, um, both so that you have the opportunity to voice and reinforce your values, but, um, you know, also so that you can start really moving some of your colleagues and constituencies along. So I'm going to talk to you today about three different bills um, that are currently moving and, and um, pretty active, actually, even just this week alone. Um, so the first is um, a bill in Oregon that um, advocates there have been working on for several years called the Reproductive Health Equity Act. Um, it's taken a couple of different forms, but um, uh, it just actually passed uh, the first committee last week, which is really exciting. Um, I'm also going to be talking to you about Illinois HB40, which some of you I'm sure have heard of at this point, especially in the last couple of days. There's um, definitely been some news around it, so we'll be talking a little bit about what that bill does. Um, and then finally, um, a bill that is um, very near and dear to my heart these days, which is a California bill that Kelly just mentioned, which is the College Student Right to Access um, bill. And, and that would, um, you know, is really focused around um, student access to abortion. So the first bill is um, the Oregon bill. So that's the Reproductive Health Equity Act. And really what this bill does, um, you know, Oregon is a, is a state that certainly, you know, no one thinks about Oregon and thinks like, oh, yes, mountains of abortion restrictions. But the reality um, is that there are still, you know, even though there might be, not be any um, restrictions written into state law, um, there are still a lot of gaps that, that push abortion out of reach for um, Oregonians. So that includes, um, you know, gaps in private insurance coverage. That includes, um, you know, coverage for immigrants who are um, denied because of citizenship status. Um, that includes trans people who, you know, aren't able to access reproductive health care because of their gender marker. Um, and so the bill, this bill really seeks to kind of close some of the gaps that are denying people coverage. It's, it's proactive, it's visionary, it's really exciting, um, and it's really brought together a very broad um, group of, of supporters. Um, and so just to kind of walk through what the bill does, um, you know, it takes specific action to, um, you know, basically ensure that um, a, a broad range of reproductive health care services, including abortion but not limited to abortion, it still covers things from preconception care, um, you know, contraception, uh, uh, breastfeeding services and supplies, um, postpartum care, et cetera. And it ensures that those services are, are available with their out-of-pocket costs. Um, second, currently, um, you know, immigrants are, are denied um, access to health care, both, um, you know, immigrants with documentation as well as undocumented immigrants. And so um, this bill would basically um, close those gaps and expand this full range of reproductive health care services um, to people regardless of their citizenship status. Um, third, it um, get to, you know, some of the issues around trans folks' um, disparities in, in access to care um, and prohibits discrimination in reproductive health care on the basis of gender identity. And finally, it codifies the right to safe and legal abortion in the state of Oregon. So it's really exciting, really expansive, um, and, you know, we'll, we'll go very far to um, ensure that, uh, that, you know, the state and, you know, folks who live, who live in the state um, are able to have um, healthy reproductive lives. Um, the other exciting thing about this bill is that, you know, it, it 
it does deal with a range of different, um, you know, different communities. And so typically, um, you know, I would say it's fairly rare that you see such a diverse coalition of organizations that have come together around this bill. Um, but there are organizations um, within the immigrants' rights community that are, you know, prioritizing this bill, um, LGBTQ organizations, um, economic justice organizations and, um, and unions. Um, because it is such a cross-cutting bill and um, really speaks to the needs of so many different communities, they've been able to build a really diverse coalition. That also means that they've been able to build a diverse coalition within Salem as well. Um, so it's a really exciting model. So the second bill I'm going to talk about is Illinois HB40, um, which again, some of you, I'm happy to answer any questions on this later on during the Q&A. Um, but just briefly, you know, Illinois is, is a state actually unlike Oregon um, that does not have Medicaid coverage of abortion. And so um, this bill, you know, is a really exciting proactive step in ensuring that, um, that you know, women who use Medicaid actually are able to get coverage for their abortion. Um, so it addresses two existing bans, or three existing bans, actually, this latest iteration exists, um, addresses three existing bans um, in the state code. So one is the ban on abortion coverage for women enrolled in Medicaid. The second is the ban on coverage for um, state employees, so that in actually includes legislators as well. Um, and then third, there's a what's called a trigger ban also in the um, state code, which basically would mean it, it was a law that was passed that says if Roe v. Wade um, goes away, um, that abortion would automatically become illegal um, in a state. So several states have this on the books, and so this bill would repeal that um, bill. So it had strong it has strong support in the House. It has you know, support in the Senate, and so um, you know the, the House is the more is the more difficult hurdle to um, to pass. So uh, you know, it's a really exciting piece of legislation, and um, you know, it's getting a lot of press right now. Um, you know, it's, it's still in my mind to be seen what happens. Um, so the governor has um, stated that he would veto the bill. Um, you know, which does sort of ostensibly go against some of what he's um, you know purported to have pro-choice values. So I think um, it's a very exciting bill just to sort of watch because, um, again, it really does go a long way to repeal some of the existing restrictions that women in Illinois are currently living under. Um, and even just in the sort of um, committee uh, committee hearings, you know, there were some examples of state legislators who themselves, you know, had to share an abortion story about a time that abortion coverage really um, was the difference between you know, going into serious debt um, and, and really being able to um, provide for their family, um, you know, when they had to have an abortion for, for a health-related reason. So the last bill um, I'm going to talk about is um, the California Student Right to Access, which is actually being heard in the Senate Committee today. Um, and the three, one of the reasons why I love this bill so much is the three um, lovely people um, that I've included on the slide um, are actually three students from Berkeley who um, are really kind of create the gen created the genesis for this bill. Um, you know, there are three three women who you know advocated on their own campus to ensure that there was access, um, both in terms of um, access on their um, you know to medication abortion at their school, um, as well as making sure that their student health insurance covered it. Um, and so, you know, as a result of that advocacy, you know, they really began asking the question, well, do all public universities in California um, provide this type of access? Um, and I think ultimately what, one of the other reasons that it's really important to us, in addition to ensuring that young people have access to abortion, um, you know, because, not just because they're young and also face other disparities, but also because, you know, affordability is a huge issue, you know, when you're not bringing any income. Um, and then the other thing is, I think, with public universities and colleges, you know, we're you're drawing from from communities that are, you know, oftentimes this is the first time going to college. They may have other, um, you know, other kind of financial obligations at home, um, and this real, you know, not having access to abortion um, really does stand in the way of a lot of their dreams. And um, you know, oftentimes, you know, it's, it's they've had to already kind of um, face so many barriers to even get to college um, that, you know, we want to do everything we can to make sure that they can, um, you know, really sort of pursue um, their dreams. So it's a really exciting bill to me, but um, the, the bill basically addresses two different, um, two different barriers that um, students are facing in California. So one 
um, you know, the bill would require that medication of abortion is available at campus health centers. So currently, um, campus health centers will mostly refer out to an off-site clinic, um, you know, which means that students have to travel, they might not have access to a car, it might not be a place where there's tons of public transportation, um, and medication abortion, you know, really should be available on college campuses um, at the health centers because it's, you know, it's less complicated, it's um, easy to, to administer, et cetera. Um, and then second was ensure that student health insurance coverage, um, you know, in, in all of these schools um, will fully cover abortion. Um, so those are the three bills um, that I wanted to highlight. And again, I really wanted to just say that there's opportunities really in, in you know, less blue states as well um, to, to advance this issue. And so we've had, you know, there's um, a bill currently in Rhode Island, which, um, you know, is a, is a very Catholic state. Um, but that, you know, addresses public insurance coverage of abortion. Um, you know, in previous years, they've been, there have been bills in Ohio as well addressing this issue. So there's definitely um, lots of opportunities, and, you know, we're very excited to work with the advocates on the ground in your state um, and with you to, to advance the issue. So before I pass it on to Lydia, I'm just going to quickly recap. Um, you know, if you want to take this issue on, I highly encourage it. Um, I think it's, it's a great way to talk about many constituencies that we care about, um, including an issue that is, um, you know, very, very important um, to the people in your state. Um, and so I really encourage you to work with advocates in your state to identify which issues around abortion coverage are the most salient and, um, you know, as well as how they interact with other barriers to abortion access that are happening in your state. Um, I would also really encourage you to think through with those advocates the communication strategy. Um, you know, especially if you're um, in a in a red state, you know, the communication um, angle that you take is a really important. But b, it's it's oftentimes like the thing that you're going to get out of um, moving a strategy on this issue, especially if you're working in a, in a situation where your bill isn't passable. Um, and so it's a really great way to really lift up um, new spokespeople, spokespeople who you know don't necessarily. Um, make it to the Capitol every single day. Um, and then three would be, I was just thinking about the Oregon example, really examine the intersection with this issue of abortion coverage with other issues. Um, you know, it intersects with immigrant rights, with economic justice. Um, and so, so it can be an inroad to really talk about, um, you know, the, the, those types of issues with colleagues who you might not work very closely with on reproductive rights or on abortion. Um, but I think there's a lot of exciting opportunity, um, you know, in, in looking at how they intersect um, across issues. So with that, um, I'm happy to take um, questions at the end, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Olivia Stuckey. So Dave, can you um, yep. share her screen? I, I will pass the screen over to Lydia. And as Rubina mentioned, if there are any questions, raise your hand or type question in the question bar. We definitely will make time uh, for those questions at the um, uh, at, after uh, Lydia presents uh, some of the pu uh, public opinion and messaging strategies to support abortion coverage. Excellent. And can uh, Lydia, you see my my? I can see your screen. Yep. Screen. So you just play your slideshow and go from there. Can you see the slideshow? From, like, I can see. Or can are you the seeing screen. the PowerPoint? Uh, I see the PowerPoint. I, I would get, yes, start, either start from the beginning, like, hit play, okay. and then I, I will, it'll blow up a little bit more. All right. I think I have two monitors, so it is. You just push the play button up in the upper left hand side of your screen. Yeah, um, I would uh, see if, uh, the play button. Is it play from the beginning or play from current slide? Yep. Mm -hmm. and that will blow it up. Yeah, I keep clicking that. So oh. we'll just do what we can well, do. This way, I can see it. Yep, we can scroll down that way. I don't. That's. Excellent. Oh, it just did, did it. Um, All right. Cool. Okay. So. I'm going to be sharing with everybody um, the, some public opinion findings around abortion coverage. This 
issue has been um, researched quite a bit over the past five years, and you may have seen conflicting um, public opinion, but I will show you what we have, and um, we have tested this internally and externally um, about four times in the past five years, and there are some other um, uh, public nonpartisan polls out there as well that I'm going to show you um, some information from as well. And then we'll talk about some messaging strategies, how to talk about this issue, and highlight your values, um, and then a few tactics um, for, for getting your message out there. So um, the three key takeaways I want you to know um, as we go um, from here is that, uh, one, supporting Medicaid and other insurance coverage for abortion is not a losing issue. Um, we have seen through a number of polls that support exceeds for Medicaid coverage and for insurance coverage exceeds 50%. Um, people oftentimes um, will say or assume that there's just this vast undercurrent of opposition. And that just does not play out in the polling that we have, that we've seen validated externally. Um, and um, along with that, we also have polling and things that show that supporting Medicaid and other insurance coverage for abortion will not hurt public officials. Um, and I don't have a full slide on that, but we do have research that shows that a majority of people actually, the opinion, your opinion on Medicaid and other insurance coverage doesn't really impact their vote one way or the other. But um, we saw even with these, the last election that it actually drove progressive more than it drove conservative, the opinion on abortion. So um, we're feeling in a pretty good place about how um, support for this issue is not necessarily, you know your district and you know your specific situation, but um, we have no evidence that shows that in, um, in many places, particularly progressive places and moderate places that this would do um, damage. Second of all, from the research, we found that messages can move people and you know, one of the things we want to dispel is that uh, if we don't talk about this issue, it will go away or we'll just get ourselves into trouble. In fact, we've seen um, from polling when we start um, with a question about Medicaid and then we provide both um, pro-choice and anti-choice messaging and then poll people at the end, people ask, actually move in a pro-choice position after hearing messages. So messages can move people. We should be saying our messages. We should be talking about this issue from our values. And um, there's no reason not to be talking about this. And third, messaging on this issue is in line with broader abortion messaging. So um, when we started moving into opinion polling processes, we weren't quite sure whether people see um, coverage for abortion and particularly Medicaid coverage as like a separate issue or what was really wrapped up into um, uh, how people think about um, coverage. And what we found is that really the underlying values that people support around abortion in general play out here as well. So that, you know, not interfering with people's personal decisions, um, supporting people's health, and I'll get a little more into that in a second, but um, there isn't a dramatic difference in messaging on this issue than messaging you might do on any other um, abortion issue. So I'm gonna show you very specifically some of the national polling that we have. This is from a public poll we released in 2015. There is a memo on this 
um, that's available on the Olive of All website, so I'm sure we can follow up with that if anyone wants um, more details, and there's much more um, polling data in that memo. But as you can see, um, we, when asked um, whether people support having Medicaid cover all pregnancy-related health care, including abortion, 56% say that they support Medicaid covering. Um, and one of the, the really interesting things that we often don't see is that 29% um, of people said that they strongly support this. And that um, beat out, or was within the margin of error, the number of people who strongly opposed. And often in polling, we'll see that the strongly, the opposition, the anti-choice side, often has lower numbers but stronger intensity, so those who strongly support. And even in this issue, we're not seeing that. So that's really exciting. Um, I also want to sh uh, show you from that poll that we tested head-to-head. -head. So we tested um, a pro-choice message versus an anti-choice message um, against each other. And we actually did two. This is just one of them. And um, the pro-choice message beat the anti-choice message by 17 points. Um, our message about we don't always know a woman's circumstances, we're not in her shoes, when politicians say Medicaid can cover childbirth but ban abortion coverage, they are interfering in decisions. Um, the abortion is not health care and we shouldn't use taxpayer dollars to pay for people's mistakes or make it easier to get an abortion. And so when people are made to choose between the two, um, you know, by 17 points, people chose the pro-choice statement. And the disparity was even larger among some of our most targeted constituencies. Um, for example, millennials um, supported the pro-choice statement 62 to 35. Independents supported the pro-choice statement 60% to 32%. And also majorities, almost 70% of African Americans supported um, the pro coverage side, and 61% of Latinos, which is another myth. We want to dispel that um, Latinos are often just thought of to be anti choice, and that's just really not true. Um, so, and I'll also mention that um, back on the national poll just last month, Vox Imperiandum um, did a poll with a similar question, and they also got a support of 55% um, supporting Medicaid coverage. And we did a follow-up, we internally did a follow-up poll just in battleground states last year and got almost exactly um, the same results. And that, both of those memos, the battleground poll that we did and the Vox um, report are available online. Um, so if you're looking for more information or um, actual hard numbers to show people, those are things you can find um, easily. So based on all of the polling and experience and the work that we do, we have kind of three core message framing values and strategies that we implement in all uh, messages that, that we do on this issue. Um, and you'll notice I say core values um, right up front because with this issue, we lead with values, we don't lead with facts, um, particularly just on abortion in general. People are better able to connect with values. Abortion is seen as an incredibly political issue, and if you, often if we just start there, um, it puts people into their battle lot, into like, kind of picking their side without listening to our arguments. So we really try and keep uh, initial conversations at the values level. So on abortion coverage, the three values um, that really resonate the strongest are respecting that people need to make their own important personal decisions and connecting how the lack of coverage is a type of interference 
with that decision making. Um, I'm going to jump down to the bottom. The second one that we see across all abortion issues is health and that insurance coverage is important to staying healthy and being able to get safe care from licensed health care providers. And then the final one that's a little bit different is the concept of fair treatment. And people really resonate with the idea that we shouldn't be treating people differently just because they're low income and that politicians shouldn't be picking on low income women or particularly burdening low income women. So I'm just going to show a couple messages um, that we often use um, that display these different message uh, message frames. So for personal decision making, when it comes to the most um, uh, important decisions in life, such as whether to become a parent, it's vital that a woman is able to consider all options available to her, however little money she makes or however she is insured. And that wraps in both the personal decision making and some of that fair treatment language that I just talked about by adding that it shouldn't matter um, how you're insured or how much money you make, that all of us should be able to make these decisions. The second message here is that policymakers should treat people fairly and not interfere with decisions. So however we feel about abortion, politicians shouldn't be allowed to deny a woman's health coverage just because she's poor. Um, I will say that this message across, uh, I think, three polls is one of the strongest um, texting messages that we have. Um, it consistently gets in the 80% um, range and um, people just really resonate with that and I will also note that the introduction however we feel about abortion is kind of a mental cue that lets people know you're willing to listen to them despite all of the nuances in their positioning um, and that it's really important and okay to be able to recognize that people may have come from different places on this issue and finally, um, connecting lack of coverage with interference. A woman struggling to make ends meet needs to be able to make important personal decisions based on what is best for her circumstances. Denying her coverage interferes with this decision. So really calling that out. I'll also um, note that when we're talking about low-income women, unfortunately, there are often stereotypes that are embedded within um, these discussions. Um, with low-income women or Medicaid um, in particular. So talking about women struggling to make ends meet or working to get by can activate them and actually help people paint a picture of a woman in their mind and in a little bit better way and help break through some of those stereotypes. And finally, after we talked about values, there are some great facts that can help move people um, towards our position. So talking about how studies show that when policymakers place restrictions on Medicaid coverage of abortion, it forces one in four poor women to carry an unwanted pregnancy to term. It's very strong, and that actually comes from research that Guttmacher has done that Kelly showed earlier. Um, a woman who wants to get an abortion but is denied is more likely to fall into poverty than a woman who can get an abortion. Um, and then also talking about how restrictions have a disproportionate impact on low-income women, women of color, immigrant women, and young women, and really calling out, that does help um, illustrate how these restrictions um, specifically hurt people and makes them more real in the minds of, uh, of uh, listeners. So the kind of final thing I want to talk about I'm happy to answer any questions, is ways to take advantage of opportunities. And so I, I mentioned above that we do want to be talking about this issue, and it helps us to talk about this issue. So ways that you could do that, and we've particularly been working with folks um, on the federal level to enhance this, um, and, you know, we're always happy to help folks um, on the state level and want to do more here you know, opportunities like giving floor statements that allow you to shape and present your values. Um, other ways to do that as well might be an op-ed or an LTE in your local paper. Um, taking um, 
advantage of your constituent outreach opportunities, your newsletters, your um, meetings with constituents to talk about this and, and start the conversation and frame it in a way that you feel comfortable with. And then, you know, sharing on social media. And um, one of the things that um, we really strive to do at All of All is lift up, enhance, and um, we have a large coalition that is willing to kind of um, help support things on social media. So when a um, uh, when someone who's an elected will talk about this issue, lots of organizations will come around and retweet and help lift that up and share support. Um, and so, you know, social media is one of the, the best ways to get this message out often, and particularly in a fast moment, um, if something's happening, um, we can really activate quickly to um, help support your message. So those are just a few ideas. Happy to talk about some other ideas um, around this, answer any questions, um, see how some of this sounds from the seat that you're sitting in. Um, and that's <laughs> well, thank you all. Um, for those of us who, I hope those of you who've joined us um, into the presentation, we've had um, three incredible presenters and leaders in the abortion rights um, movement, um, all playing a role in supporting proactive policy, uh, not just push against the bad stuff, but um, create the conditions that we um, expand equality. Uh, and, and justice uh, through I mean, expansion of abortion rights um, that have been, we've been hearing from, um, talking at the broad uh, national level um, and multi-state level, uh, talking about specific proactive policies that can be led at the local and state level, and um, just um, finishing up with some best practices on how to talk about this, how to have this conversation. To, um, not to be afraid about talking about this and political repercussions, but more importantly, realizing the value for being a leader um, and uh, a leader uh, enforcing this conversation and being a champion um, and advancing proactive abortion rights policy. Uh, we've got, um, we have time for um, some questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please click on the uh, control panel on, on the hand icon, uh, and I can unmute you or type questions in the question bar uh, for either Kelly, Lydia, or Ravina, um, or I'm referring to anybody else who's going to be joining us. Pause a moment for that. I'll, I'll throw out uh, kind of a starter question. Um, we, talk, we, we talked about kind of like the conditions of where we are and some ideas on how to advance things and how to talk about it. Uh, can any one of you or all three of you talk about, do you see a shift in the courage, willingness, and I guess priority to make this a focal point, um, make this topic a focal point at the, legislative, at the state legislative level or local community? Do you see an uptick in enthusiasm to be able to, of doing that? Um, or is it still, uh, are, are we very much still trapped in the space of convincing policy leaders that um, it's popular and you should do this for the following reasons? I can answer that. Um, so the answer is yes. Well, the answer to your first part of your question is yes, which is that is there an uptick in enthusiasm? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I think, I mean, there is, and I think it's really over the last, a um, couple of years, like the, the work that, that the reproductive rights and justice movement um, has done to really elevate this issue, like, you know, in cooperation with all of all and, and convened, you know, through our campaign has, has you know, the goal of our campaign um, has really been to bring this issue out of the shadows. And um, I, I feel fairly confident that, you know, we've, we've seen some really exciting successes. So that includes introducing the Each Woman Act and introducing the state bills. Um, you know, that, that I talked about today, introducing, I think we're up to about 15 resolutions um, in local bodies. Um, you know, I think people are really um, understanding that you really can't um, take on the mantle of, of abortion and abortion access without talking about um, access to abortion coverage. Um, 
and so you know I think we see a lot of enthusiasm over the over the um, fall. We had uh, you know the Hyde Amendment turned 40, and all the ball partners across the country did I think over 150 actions, um, and there are actions in every single state um, calling on. Um, you know, calling for the Hyde Amendment to be dismantled and for abortion coverage to be restored, both at the state and at the um, federal level. So I think that there's a lot of enthusiasm and excitement about this. Um, you know, the question is, like, given the kind of current landscape at the federal level, you know, it's, I think it's creating um, additional enthusiasm for, you know, progressive um, lawmakers who really want to um, take this issue on. When we, when, we introduced, when we reintroduced the Each Woman Act this year, we had really, really strong support with reintroduction. Um, and then I think, you know, the, in the, the landscape in the state certainly has, um, it's been really hostile, a hostile environment for reproductive rights in general in the states and for abortion access in general. Um, but I think, you know, we see more and more advocates um, really wanting to take this on as a core priority for their work. Um, so, you know, certainly we'll always have someone to convince, but, um, you know, we see our progressive champions as really, you know, stepping up on this issue. Again, folks can type in questions or raise their hand uh, if they have any questions um, for our very esteemed panelists who can, uh, I mean, are, genu are really experts in the field and leaders in helping advance uh, abortion rights around this country. A question that came in from uh, Cindy from Mississippi, um, and asking, uh, is it is it the same? I guess a little bit related to the previous question, I guess that I asked, uh, is the enthusiasm the same in red states where uh, conservative majorities are pushing through um, restrictive uh, policies? Um, so I guess maybe uh, what I guess could you speak a little bit to the environment in these? tougher areas, tougher areas at least from a, from a political perspective in the votes necessary um, to, uh, to advance this, uh, this work. Um, can you speak to you know, kind of like the, the red-blue divide and, and, and specifically um, why should advocates, activists, and political leaders be having this fight in red states? Sure, this is Kelly. I can um, try to take a stab at that, and I think it's a, a great question. Um, I mean, I think is the is it the same? I don't know that it's the same in terms of sheer number, but I think if it's around, is there an increased energy? I think that extends to all communities and states, and I think um, you know, seeing some of the the town hall turnouts in red states is encouraging. Um, you know, the work that groups like the Indivisible Guide. Um, and others are really doing. I, I, I actually, they seem to have almost more turnout in red states than they do in, um, uh, you know, kind of more progressive cities or states. So I, I think the energy is there. And I think, again, it just has to be, um, we have to be able to identify and harness those people into political action and um, other civic engagement. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we do sometimes focus groups and, you know, message testing on various things in different communities around the country. And, um, you know, I think Lydia's point about leading with values is the winner um, kind of all around. And it doesn't matter usually whether we're in a blue state or a red state or, um, you know, a blue city within a red state or whatever the case might be. I think, you know, that kind of values-based um, messaging is what is what I am hearing appeals to people. Um, and you know the specifics of what which value appeals to which community just kind of varies. But uh, Lydia, I'd be curious if you have different thoughts or, or um, a disagreement. No, that has been our our um, uh, what we've seen as well, particularly in states like Mississippi and Alabama, um, that leading with values and starting in that values place. Um, can be useful in starting conversations and I think I agree with, in general there's I think a renewed sense of energy everywhere we're seeing just generally our action rates are going up and that's pretty consistent I think folks now can 
get activated online and in new ways, which um, I think makes people feel more included. Um, and we've been hearing that from partners all over, that you know, new people are showing up, not just folks who have been active before and maybe kind of declined, but there's just this whole new set of folks and energy um, all over wanting um, to get involved right now, and we're all working as hard as we can to to um, harness that and turn it into to actions. And we're also trying to come up with ways if you, people are in states that you know maybe a legislative bill isn't um, ideal. Um, there are other ways that people can get involved. Um, so. And we're happy to be creative and think with folks about options like that. Can I just add one more thing? This is Ravina. So, you know, I used to, Dave said it in my bio, I used to work in Arkansas and Mississippi on abortion issues. So I think I totally agree with everything that Kelly and Lydia said. Um, and, of course, like, want to acknowledge that, you know, in a state like Mississippi, it is, it's, it's really hostile. Um, and that, so that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of work to be done around this issue, and it, it's not like it's going to just sort of easily take off. I think the question is whether or not, um, you know, folks really want to start that conversation in their states. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that, that whether or not you want to start it has less to do with how hostile the environment is and more about, you know, whether or not you see value in having that conversation. So I'm just even looking at the screen right now that Lydia has shared, which she didn't go over the slide. But that's actually an example, that's actually a banner drop that's happening in Texas, which, you know, if anybody, if any state Mississippi was going to give you a run for your money in terms of abortion restrictions and, and the level of hostility towards abortion, it would probably be Texas. And, um, you know, these are folks that are unfurling a banner around abortion coverage and, and, a, and an abortion coverage ban that's being introduced or that's um, making its way through the Texas legislature. And, you know, they're standing up for this issue even though, you know, the, the level of hostility towards this, this issue within within the state legislature is very high. So, um, yeah, I hope that kind of answers your question a little bit, too. No, I think that, and that's great. I mean, it, I mean without having the conversation, it makes it hard to have this pent-up energy that's, I mean, that we see out there um, to move into it. But more importantly, to um, shape the and kind of the public environment to whom this conversation is and the polling overwhelmingly demonstrated where the public support um, is with us. Um, and uh, we, we need champions to start the conversation. And there's an element of courage because the opposition is fierce. And especially even in these more conservative areas where they've got the political power um, today um, and not forever. I mean, it, it was, that, you know, all those answers were, were really helpful. We have a policy question that came through um, that uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, is there uh, data about the effect of Medicaid funding for abortion on the number of abortions? Um, I guess what impact um, it actually has on women? Um, do they find uh, where do they find the money? Um, other information. I mean, are are, are children being born um, that are not wanted? I and mean, is there a way to I mean, kind of quantify the effect? I mean, some kind of apples to oranges comparison between uh, states that have, I mean, go out of their way to make it difficult versus um, uh, the, the states that are actually trying to find a way to um, provide equal access for everyone. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, Kelly and Lydia, who might have the strongest handle on the turnaround study or the turnaway study um, findings? Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, um, I will just say that one of um, the strongest facts that I mentioned um, is this fact that studies show that when policymakers place restrictions on Medicaid coverage, it forces one in four poor women to carry an unwanted pregnancy to term. That fact resonates very strongly. Um, and there is more data. Maybe Kelly might know more um, about the data specifically. Yes. Yeah. What I have um, in front of me comes from a, a couple of sources, which I can highlight. And um, so, a couple of facts. First, about 69% of women obtaining abortions live close to or below the federal poverty level. Um, and uh, 
you know, women who can't afford an abortion can it can take up to three weeks um, of them trying to you know kind of find the the money to be able to do that um, before they can get the procedure. And of course, you know, abortion is gets more expensive and harder to access the longer that you wait. So it's this really difficult cycle of, of trying to catch up to it. Um, you know, it, it's really hard as you can imagine to um, quantify. Uh, people who are seeking an abortion but never can make it to the clinic, right? Like we don't, we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know how many women aren't reaching the place that they need to go. Um, we do know that um, uh, that uh, if a woman is ultimately unable to afford an abortion, she um, and she's therefore forced to continue the pregnancy kind of against her her wishes she's then three times more likely to fall below the federal poverty line within two years. So there are some, um, some you know, facts of quantifiable impact um, that some studies have found. And the Turnaway study that Ravina mentioned is an incredibly um, detailed and long-term study out of um, ANSWER, Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health at UCSF, um, that has, has looked at a variety of um, impacts on uh, women who were seeking abortion and were turned away because, um, uh, for in many cases, because they were too far along in their pregnancy and couldn't um, get to a provider. So, and kind of measures the various impacts on their um, emotional health, their uh, income levels, their relationships, you know, all kinds of things. And um, there's kind of too much data there to go into right now, but um, uh, hopefully some of that is helpful. It's hard. You can't really, I think Dave, you started to sort of ask around kind of an apples to apples comparison across state lines, but because of the differences in, um, uh, you know, how many providers the state has, you know, Mississippi only has one, for example, and New York has, uh, you know, more than that. Um, it's, it's difficult to get that kind of direct comparison and because of the, you know, various patchwork of state laws that um, each state might have. No, I think, I think you answered that really well. Um, the, uh, given that, uh, in, particularly in these more conservative states, that are taking steps to ban abortion insurance coverage, not just for Medicaid, uh, but really imposing coverage uh, among private insurance or making, making opposing it as a met, kind of an inclusionary uh, benefit of an overall pro, um, insurance package, um, Given that that's occurring, uh, what is the, I and mean, where are the insurance companies in all of this? It seems that not only is it playing with their actuary tables and um, health coverage uh, formulas, um, it would seem that they actually end up paying more for um, uh, undesired pregnancies uh, in, in some ways. Yeah, there was a lot of work around this, of course, when the ACA initially was um, being debated in Congress. You know, the, the folks might recall, of course, the Stupac Amendment and then ultimately the Nelson um, language that was ultimately in the ACA and which um, basically opened the door, well, explicitly opened the doors for states to decide on their own if they wanted to ban private insurance coverage for abortion. And so, um, you know, Ravina talked about the, the increase in attention to and support for abortion coverage overall, and I think it's really tied to how that ACA conversation really opened this door about um, about what insurance companies should cover and how it's, it's so super complicated. And once you start sort of parsing out like, oh, well, this person gets a tax subsidy to buy their, um, you know, health insurance plan on an exchange and this person doesn't, what counts as tax dollars? Like at the end of the day, um, just cover it. People just want it to be covered. Like it, it doesn't need to be that complicated. And, um, you know, unfortunately, stemming from that Nelson language in the ACA, we had, um, I think now we're up to 25 states who did take that step of banning private insurance coverage for abortion with various exceptions. And um, yeah, it, it has just kind of, I think, further cemented this idea that abortion is somehow outside of other reproductive health care, um, when we know that, again, it's incredibly common and it's safe and it's a, a part of uh, many women's reproductive health care experiences in their lifetime. Um, it was hard before the ACA to kind of get a really good uh, grasp on the numbers of, of uh, how many private insurance companies were providing abortion coverage um, and how they felt about it. There was a variety of kind of secret shopper attempts, other bigger um, data um, attempts from folks like Kaiser Family Foundation and Guttmacher. Um, and by everybody's best account, it seems that um, 
about 80% of private insurance companies pre-ACA were covering abortion um, in some way, just because, again, it's not, it wasn't a political issue for them. It was just about um, how their health insurance plans work. So um, I think it, it has become more political, but um, which is bad in, in many states, but the, the ver- other result, of course, of the other side of that is that it has led to this, um, you know, increased attention to how abortion is, gets segmented out and how inherently unjust and unfair that is. Great. Well, I think uh, our panelists today have been very thorough. I mean, this might be the shortest number of questions, I and mean, the, the amount of information that you uh, pushed out in less than an hour is incredible. Um, and I think so incredibly helpful uh, to activists, um, advocate, orga- advocate organizations and individuals, as well as policymakers. Um, this really, uh, to really move the needle on this, uh, on this work, it's going to require that inside-outside strategy. Policy leaders with the courage to speak up and force the conversation, and advocates, advocates in the grassroots um, public to join in that fight. And I just want to thank um, our panelists today uh, for, I mean, re- I really I mean, going deep into I mean, these topics and um, providing a host of resources for um, everyone who's joining us around the country. I'll give uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, all three of you the final word, um, and we'll wrap up. Um, thank you so much. This is Kelly. Thank you, everybody. Um, I uh, Feel free to reach out, kbaden at reprorights.org, um, and probably to any one of us if you have specific questions. Um, and our um, uh, website is reproductiverights.org. And then I also mentioned the actforwomen.org website, which is around the Federal Women's Health Protection Act, but includes some resources for state legislators and other state leaders who are interested in lifting that bill up in your own communities. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hi, and this is Ravina. I'll also just wrap up and say bye. Um, so, yeah, you can reach me also at Ravina, that's R A V I N A, at allabaval.org. Um, and please feel free to follow us on social media or visit our website, allabaval.org. Um, and I think the only thing I would just leave you with is, you know, we really encourage um, you to, to take this issue on and to really um, work with state advocates in your state who really are the experts on um, the landscape around abortion writ large and, and certainly abortion coverage. Um, you know, to, to really take this issue on and, and create a strategy around it because we think it's a, you know, a winning issue and, um, and also one that um, is, you know, just core to really being able to access reproductive health care and, and live um, a happy and healthy life. Um, yeah, Lydia? Yeah. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for all the work that you do every day. Um, and... If you have any questions about messaging or want any more support uh, on that, I would encourage that you actually reach out to Ravina, who can connect you up um, or and, and figure out what you need and, and connect you with us and other resources. Um, the polling memos that um, I mentioned are available on allbeval.org, um, or you can reach out to Ravina, who can help guide you in the right direction on those. Um, and Otherwise, um, good luck, and I hope you guys have a a great afternoon. Well, thank you, uh, and thank you all for uh, everyone who joined us this afternoon. Uh, Stay tuned for um, other uh, policy and communication training sessions like this uh, to really help us move the needle in advancing uh, equity and justice um, in our local communities, our states, and across the country. Until next time, everyone, thank you, and goodbye. Thank you.